Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the editor in chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at our Terrace IP with Kurt Schuler, who's going to talk today about what's new in the new version of ISO 26262. So, Kurt, what's going on with ISO 26262, which is now the standard for automotive safety and what everybody seems to be adhering to in terms of autonomous driving? So, Ed, we're um, on the ISO 26262 working groups. We're having our uh, final plenary meeting in July prior to the voting for the final version of the second edition of ISO 26262. Uh, this is something that we've worked on uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, um, myself included uh, directly on uh, part 11 which is a new semiconductor uh, focused part of the ISO 26262. Um, so that's one of the new concepts there. Uh, the other uh, issue that we're dealing with here is something we call fail operational. That's in uh, parts 10 and parts 5 and some of those uh, ideas and concepts are explained in ISO 26262. There are some new levels that crept into uh autonomous driving, some of them are, uh, we, we tend to look at it in terms of level two versus five versus six. Uh, where are we now and where did those levels come from? Okay, well there's there's two different uh, sets of levels which are uh, by NHTSA, the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration and SAE, which used to be called Society of Automotive Engineers, but it's just called SAE International now. And they're actually different numbering systems for the same thing. So if I were to draw these up on a board, um, how we generally look at it. So if you look at, um, if you have adaptive cruise control or some lane keeping, that's here. If your car has nothing, obviously that's here. You have a, a Tesla, which is accelerating, slowing down, braking, um, that is here. Where things get more interesting is here and here. When you're at level two, a human being is going to take control. Now, when you're at level three, in, there's in specific situations where the car can be by itself, uh, fully autonomous. So, and you could sit there and text or whatever. So this would be usually on some set aside roads where there's going to be other autonomous vehicles. There's a lot of infrastructure work that will have to be determined for what level three is and, you know, how that gets implemented on the road. But the point there is that there's a big lag time between when you would ever have to take control over the car um, if there's a situation. Now level four and five are, you know, this is like the fully autonomous. The level four, this is, uh, SAE has uh, four, four of these levels, uh, NHTSA has five. Think of level four as a sub-level five where you know, there may be weather or some other things that make the car uh, not able to be autonomous and that that would be acceptable under level four and five. But right now, you know, the state of the art is here. Uh, most of the higher end cars and even some of the mid-end cars are here. The vast majority of cars are still here. Okay, so now where does ISO 26262 intersect with this? Well, one of the big things with this is you have to have built in, you know, we use the term functional safety. You have to have functional safety features built into these vehicles. Even when you're back here, you know, you have functional safety uh, requirements for anti-lock braking systems, engine control units, things like that. When you start talking up here, you start talking controllability of the vehicle. And ISO 26262 makes an assumption that whenever you downgrade from an automatic system, there's going to be a human being that is the last level of grabbing that wheel and doing something. Well, as I just said, when you're out here, the human being is not necessarily the one who's going to be grabbing that wheel. It's going to be the system itself. When you're talking level five, there is no wheel. So that will have a lot of changes um, for ISO 26262 in the future. And we're just starting to see the beginning of that in this new edition when we talk about the concept of fail operational and how we go about going from, hey, I'm in, let's say, an ASL D mode something happens, I have to go down to a different mode, let's say an ESOL A mode, where a human being is involved. And today, that's what it is. In the future, I'll be in an ESOL D mode, there will be a fault, there will be, the fault will be uh, detected, and we will, we, instead of downgrading, we will still have to somehow remain in a mode that is safe. And if it's a totally autonomous vehicle, that is still an ESOL D mode. So with the new ISO standard that's coming out, does that start building in some of the capabilities of what you're actually going to see eventually when steering wheel is optional? 
it, it's building in the concepts for the analysis of how to uh, look at diagnostic coverage to achieve that. It doesn't necessarily uh, uh, proscribe any technologies to get there, whether from a functional safety standpoint or just from a functional standpoint, but it's, it's forcing us to look at, hey, um, if a human being is not the last level of defense and it's the system, how do I go about mathematically determine whether a system would be um, reliable or safe enough to be able to be um, the, the brain, if you will, of a level four or level five vehicle? So what does this look like visually on a car that's failing? Okay, so let me draw a use case here. And this is a simplified use case that um, you'll see in the new specification. And um, this is a, uh, an example of a fail operational use case. I'm gonna draw a vertical axis here. And this is the speed of the vehicle. And the horizontal axis is time. Now, there's gonna be a few lines across here. And what I'm gonna draw is, there's a, a speed here where we've determined from our HARA, our, our hazard and risk assessment, that below this speed, we are safe uh, for ASIL A. And this will be our, our fallback, our, 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 our fault mode that we're gonna deal with. Now, ideally what we wanna do is we have our max speed right here and some other speed here, which is the range at which we can do autonomous driving with ASIL D. So while we are going through this use case, I wanna point out a few different areas. So this right here, this range here in green is, is our normal mode. Now something is gonna happen that's gonna take us out of normal mode. And what it's going to do then is it's gonna force us into a different mode. It's gonna force us into our fault mode. And fault mode, you can still get off the road, right? If something happens? Correct. In this particular case, we're assuming a human being is eventually going to take over control of this vehicle. And there's going to be a lot of terminology that I'm going to use to describe what's happening that you see in the spec. But this becomes very important because to determine whether something's safe, you have to make an assessment of in this amount of time, is it safe enough when I'm going at this speed, which might be 100 kilometers per hour, or uh, which is about 60 miles per hour, to this lower speed. Is this enough time where a human being can safely take it over? So there's a lot of judgment that goes into this um, and actually some science and human factors engineering. Cars that are autonomous tend to be driving very closely together. Is there enough time to be able to zip out of that lane of traffic so that you don't slow everybody else down and cause other problems? So when we start talking about um, some of the, the metrics in here, the time between when the fault happens, so let me just draw that up. So. We're going along at a certain speed, we're following traffic, and all of a sudden, fault happens here. Well, even though that fault in the system happened here, it actually might not be detected until here, let's say. So that's one of the questions you gotta look at. Rate times time equals distance. What's my safe following distance from the car? I have a fault. I, I detect it here at a certain time afterwards. If I'm following too close, bad things could happen. So that helps determine that. So this is reaction time. And this it's reaction time not only of the human, but also of the system. Well, actually, this is just being detected. The reaction time comes next. So call this reaction time. Uh, the other is a, the change in operating mode. This is when the system does something. So bad thing happens. System sees it, system, system does something. And what's happening during this time here is that the system is going to say, hey, let's decrease the speed as quickly as possible. Boom. The time here, fault tolerant time interval. So um, this is when we're crossing that ASIL D line. We are fault tolerant in this space, um, but 
but no longer, right? But as you start going below that, you've got to have more and more um, uh, interaction from either outside the system or backup systems. And what's happening here is that over time, you're immediately going into um, this uh, uh, safe mode or safer mode, which is the fault mode. What's the acceptable time frame that this will happen in? That depends. Um, again, it depends at what speed you're going. Um, the good thing is with electronics, you're dealing, you know, picoseconds, nanoseconds. Uh, the bad thing is in the real world, um, you're dealing with milliseconds. But, um, you know, the, the issue is a lot of different things have to happen in here electronically and mechanically to get you to this point. And actually, this line is actually drawn here. Sorry. This is where you're in your physics mode when you cross that line there. So... What's usually, how this is usually done is with that electronic system may have a whole separate backup system that is able to keep the car safe so that the human being can drive it. It'll automatically do the deceleration and allow the human being to maintain control with the steering wheel and the accelerator, getting it down to the speed as quickly as possible so they can do it. So some of the uh, diagrams that I've seen about how these uh, cars initially will be rolled out is that there will be a, a separate lane for autonomous vehicles, mm -hmm. then two others that won't be autonomous. Yes. How is it going to mesh with those uh, different lanes that are not autonomous when you're trying to fail over? Well, that's going to be hard. When you're here, That what you're describing is, is basically level three. Um, the, what, the technologies that will make this um, viable are one, the onboard technologies that we're talking about here, uh, the what we call uh, V to X, so it's vehicle to vehicle interaction and vehicle to infrastructure interaction, so there's communication going around so that you can basically um, caravan vehicles through with each other. Now when there is a problem, what will ha would have to happen is as soon as that fault's detected, in addition to slowing down, getting out of the way, whatever, it's gonna have to communicate to the other cars to let it know hey, I got a problem here, and they're going to have to take an, an action too. Um, if it's random, you know, hugely accelerating, it's got to tell the car up front. If it's going to be slowing down, it's got to tell the cars in the back. So that's a good point for those, for on, on that thing. What has to happen on the design side? What, what would uh, system engineers have to think about in terms of when they're designing this stuff? What changes there? Well, th there's two types of uh, different sets of functionality that for to implement fail operational in a system uh, that you have to do, uh, whether it's at a broad system level or at the lowest gate level, you have to pick and choose where you do it. But I'll draw those up on the board. Uh, the first one is actually good uh, in a lot of different use cases, whether you have transient faults or permanent faults. And so this uh, technique is called two out of three or triple mode redundancy. So it's, it's very common, uh, you know, I come from an aerospace background, and we were doing this back on the airplanes I flew uh, back in the 90s. But basically you have an input, you have some type of module, and then you have a voter. And so what this can do, whether it's a tran whether there's a transient or permanent fault uh, with, with, within either of these modules, if there's two out of three that are correct or that share the same data, one that doesn't have the same output given the same input, it assumes that the one that doesn't have the same one is bad, shuts it off, and keeps running with the other two. Now, this is a degraded state, right? So, you know, it could be a different ASO, there could be still be a backup system, but the point is, is that you are able to continue on and function just as you had before. Now, the other uh, technique is a little bit different here, and this is more, uh, this is effective for when you have permanent faults. So let's say uh, a stuck, uh, stuck at, uh, you know, power glitch, something like that. So you have module A, module B, and what is different in this design is there's a whole bunch of diagnostics here. So in our world in semiconductor, I mean this could be stuff that you're you're basically doing, you know, so let's say through a JTAG scan chain what while the system's still running. But the point is here is you're doing a test somehow to figure out whether one of these is basically unreliable or dead. 
And once it is, you shut it off, and you're just running on the one. Again, a degraded state. You're, you're, if you're, if this, for example, is an autonomous vehicle, you're going to have to have some kind of backup vehicle, backup system to be able to get this thing safely to the side of the road and fixed. But that is one way that you can do that. Um, for transients, this doesn't necessarily work for transient faults because if you do get different answers here, um, it doesn't give you the same protection as you have over here. And one of the things about autonomous vehicles is we tend to think about this in terms of we drive 100,000 miles, you get a, a warranty for the first 50,000 miles or 40,000 miles, whatever it happens to be, and maybe for the drive in 100,000. 100,000 miles on an autonomous vehicle may be, it's driven all the time. It's used for transporting people on a regular basis. So that could be in a year or less. Mm -hmm. So these are completely different kinds of uh, uh, metrics that we're starting to apply into reliability here, right? Yeah, if you look at the futurists, I mean, they're saying, hey, you're not going to own the car. It's just going to be out there floating around when you need it. You get on your app like Uber or what have you, and then just the, you know, the, the vehicle comes, you hop in, and you go on your, on your ride. Uh, so the, the point is, is to get maximum utilization of these vehicles. So they're, they're running, you know, 100% of the time. If you look at statistics today, I mean, my car's out there in the parking lot right now. It spends eight hours a day, 10 hours a day doing absolutely nothing while I'm at work. Um, that will change. So we'll have fewer vehicles, we'll have a heck of a lot more miles on them. What that means is these reliability um, and safety features are more important than ever because, you know, if you look at, you know, we, we think along the lines of, oh, you know, ASLD, you know, less than 10 uh, fits, you know, that's less than 10 um, errors or faults per um, uh, life affecting faults per billion hours. Doesn't sound like much, but, you know, that that's one accident ever every you know 114,000 years something like that but you multiply that by 80 million cars in a year uh, that's a lot of accidents right and the utilization on these cars is going to be even more is security baked into this new standard as well ah yes <laughs> so that's one of the issues that we have um uh on the ISO 262262 working group within the SAE, SAE does have a couple of security uh, or calm specifications or, or guidance. Um, ISO 262262 currently does not. Uh, they tend to overlap. Uh, there's a lot of discussion of should they be in one specification, should they not. Um, from a philosophical standpoint, does it matter whether it's a natural cause that causes a fault or whether it's a, it's a human being hacker who hacks into your system. The good thing is, is there, there is technical overlap where some of these techniques do help protect you from a security standpoint, but the short answer is no, there is not a um, all encompassing specification for automotive security or for any autonomous um, uh, type hardware, whether in industrial or trains or anything else. Kurt Schiller, thanks for a great explanation. You're welcome.